Right, and uh, hopefully uh, you can all uh, see this um, reasonably uh, clearly. Um, thanks especially to everyone that's uh, attended previous talks and uh, has uh, come back, because that's, uh, that's always a good sign, that's always uh, nice. Um, and uh, hopefully uh, we'll be able to do this again at some point in, uh, in person. Um, so we've got um, 50 minutes or so that I'm going to be talking, so hopefully I'll run to a schedule. Um, there isn't really time to do a sort of full biography of um, either of these men individually, let alone both together. Um, but what I'm hoping to do is just give some anecdotes which will hopefully um, give a bit of uh, perspective um, to uh, both of them. Okay. Right, so uh, here we have them. So um, this uh, image of Ismay is from uh, 1891 and um, it's similar to a quite famous photo of him which was taken in 1899. Um, and of course uh, at the time of the Titanic disaster he, he looked quite a bit older. I think for many of us we picture him in his, uh, in his younger years. So uh, Ismay was born in uh, 1862 um, among other um, schools, he attended Harrow and uh, he then uh, served an apprenticeship with uh, his father's firm, uh, the Oceanic Steam Navigation Company, or of course the White Star Line, um, and uh, became the New York agent. Um, it was during his time in New York he uh, married an American lady, 1888, and he was admitted to the partnership of the firm in 1891. There's quite a famous anecdote that uh, when he was working for White Star, he left his uh, coat and uh, a hat, I think it was, in his father's office. And uh, this was as he used to do, you know, when he was a child, when he was visiting or something of that sort. And um, his father rang for one of the clerks and he said, can you please tell the new office boy that he's not to leave his hat and coat just lying around in my office? Um, this was reportedly quite humiliating for Bruce. However, I, I think you, you're probably seeing there that Ismay Senior is sending a signal both to Bruce that he needs to succeed on his own merits and also to uh, other employees of the White Star Line that actually he might be my son, but he still needs to, um, you know, to, uh, to pull his weight. Um, now, uh, Smith, we can see this photo of Smith was actually taken in the summer of 1911. So um, I, I've cropped it. He's actually standing next to Lord Pirrie of Hound and Wolf on the boat deck of Olympic at Southampton in June 1911. Um, so Smith was 61 when this um, photo was taken. Um, one of the odd things about Smith is that he got younger as time went on. So in June 1911, he signed on to Olympic and he gave his age as 61. In April 1912, when he was 62, he signed on to Titanic and he gave his age as 59. So he's managed to drop two years um, in the space of uh, less than one year from his age. Um, so Smith was born in Hanley um, in uh, 1850. Um, he passed his master's certificate at Liverpool, uh, age of 25, uh, 1875. Uh, he joined the White Star Line at the start of the 1880s. His first White Star command was Baltic in 1888, and then he commanded various ships um, rising uh, through the ranks. Uh, he commanded Majestic for the longest time, that was nine years from 1895. And then in 1904, 1907, 1911, he took out White Star's newest ships on their maiden voyages. So that's Baltic, Adriatic, Olympic. And of course, as we know, that uh, followed with Titanic in, uh, in 1912. So just to give a bit of context here, um, the White Star Line as we know it um, essentially began in 1869 and uh, this chart simply shows the growth in the White Star Line and uh, how uh, successful the, the company became. Um, is one thing worth noting is that the figure for 1914 excludes the Britannic, which is another 50,000 tonnes. And of course, Titanic is not included either because she was lost in 1912. So 
when you see that you can probably add about 100,000 tonnes to the 1914 figure to see what was planned as opposed um, to what uh, actually happened. But White Star by the start of the 20th century was one of the most profitable shipping lines on the North Atlantic and on many measures you could argue it was the most uh, profitable. Um, Ismay Senior died in uh, 1899 and um, Bruce Ismay essentially took over as, uh, as head of the White Star Line chairman and uh, the managing director. Um, of course, as we know, White Star passed into American ownership in uh, 1902. This was something that was um, quite controversial, to say the least, at the time. Um, and uh, this here is an example of one of the letters that uh, Bruce Ismay got. He, I think he had a, quite a few sacks of post um, to this effect. Um, so it, they didn't give their name. They signed themselves as a loyal Englishman. Um, and uh, as we can see, they're essentially saying, well, you know, why are you selling out to the Yankees? Why are you selling out to the Americans? And are you proud that you're going to be dictated to by J.P. Morgan, the uh, American uh, uh, finance um, uh, chief? Um, and actually, can, can we not manage our own affairs? Um, but uh, nonetheless, the, uh, the takeover um, happened. Um, we have quite a lot of correspondence from Ismay. Um, initially, he was quite reluctant to give information to the Americans. I mean, it was really a hostile um, bid initially. Um, but once it had gone through, Ismay's um, business sense kind of comes through. He's um, talking a lot about how they can prosper now that they are in this large shipping combine. And um, Ismay was not just head of the White Star Line, but in 1904, he took over as head of IMM, um, the huge American combine. And this was because JP Morgan and others had confidence in Ismay, and they thought that uh, he was a highly uh, regarded businessman. So um, it's a sign there of his skill, and it's not just the case of the son um, in inheriting uh, uh, control from the father. Now the um, relations with Cunard are, are quite interesting. Um, one of the surprising things is that Cunard gave uh, free tickets to Ismay and also his family as a, as a professional courtesy and um, this also extended to his wife. And so in uh, at the start of uh, 1908 Cunard's agent in New York, so a guy called Vernon Brown, was advised that Ismay's wife, uh, Florence, was sailing on the Lusitania. And um, Cunard uh, checked their bookings and they found that the Regal Suite in first class wasn't booked. So uh, they gave that to uh, Mrs. Ismay. And she wrote to Cunard afterwards and said uh, that they'd had a, a comfortable voyage. Now, Cunard were a bit perturbed, really, because... Um, word got back to them that people in White Star's office had been commenting on the the, uh, the vibration and basically that the Lusitania wasn't a very comfortable ship and um, the, uh, the quote was that Mrs Ismay had never had such a shaking up in her life um, which is quite contrary to what she'd written to Cunard that she had a comfortable voyage and we actually have a report from Cunard's agent in New York and um, he said that the story had originated from uh, Ismay so uh, the quote was, I think it was Mr. Ismay, but I think it was really said as a joke. So um, um, it wasn't too much a case of, um, you know, disparaging a, a rival uh, shipping company. In fact, one of the uh, remarkable things is that although Cunard and White Star were fierce rivals, they did cooperate in areas of mutual interest. Um, so uh, what we see here is a photo of Olympic's B-deck enclosed promenade. Um, I think it was taken in 1911. And uh, you can see on the right here, I appreciate from the angle it's not very clear, but they're essentially the, the wooden windows um, enclosing um, the, uh, the first class state rooms. And um, what was remarkable was that um, these windows were actually similar to those that were fitted on Cunard's Mauritania. So uh, remarkably, in at some point in 1908-1909, Ismay had wrote to Cunard and said, well actually can you supply us with the drawings of the windows that, uh, that we used on Mauritania? 
Um, Ismay travelled on Mauritania in uh, 1910 and um, it then had Harland and Wolf um, given the full-size working drawings of Mauritania's windows via the Cunard company and um, that's, uh, that went a large way to uh, determining uh, what was on Olympic. Right, so probably no discussion of Ismay is complete without some reference to, uh, to lifeboats. And um, of course what Ismay is commonly criticised for, it's it said that um, it was recommended that there were enough lifeboats for everyone on Olympic and Titanic, and that Ismay was keen on economy and that he whittled the number down. And that uh, therefore um, that was why um, the, the ships didn't carry enough lifeboats for everyone on board. Um, it's a very detailed subject and I'm, I just here want to add a bit of um, context to it. So this is the Design D uh, proposal that uh, Ismay and Harold Sanderson, um, so White Star Line directors, um, were shown by Harland and Wolf in 1908 and it's the one they approved. And as we can see here, there are 16 lifeboats on the boat deck, so you've got eight on each side. And this is very similar to what the ship sailed with. In fact, the, the only major difference really is that the lifeboats amidships um, were moved to the fore end of the boat deck. So they're on the officer's promenade and not the first class promenade area. So um, it, it opened that up um, uh, for them. Um, so um, after the initial design proposal in uh, 1909, um, the White Star Line was shown proposals to install well in Davits by Harland and Wolf and specifically Alexander Carlyle. Um, these are a superior new type of uh, lifeboat Davit that could, um, well, they, were, they were more efficient, they required fewer men essentially to operate them and also the, uh, the benefit of them was that they could carry more than one lifeboat, they could um, uh, accommodate two, three or even potentially four. Um, and um, Ismay and the White Star Line approved the use of these um, new uh, davits and um, the intention was that if the lifeboat regulations changed in the future they would be able to fit more lifeboats to these ships as, uh, as required. Um, now one of the things that isn't commented on very much is actually that the number of passengers and crew that these ships were going to carry was um, decreased during the design stage. So there's actually quite a significant reduction in the number of passengers these ships were going to carry. Now at the same time, before Olympic and Titanic were completed, Ismay and the White Star Line approved a plan for four additional collapsible boats to be fitted. So this increased the number of lifeboats from 16 to 20. Now um, what we see here is actually a table of the combination of those two um, design decisions. So you can see at the top the uh, passenger capacity has actually been decreased quite significantly, mainly because they carried fewer third class passengers. Um, and the lifeboat capacity has increased. So if we look at the lifeboat capacity as a percentage of passengers and crew, it's gone up from about 25% to uh, under 35%, um, which of course is nowhere near everyone on board but it, it's a it's a significant proportional increase and also we need to bear in mind that ships of these this sort um, actually it, they only really sailed fully booked at the height of the season um, on average if you take the, the whole year round they were probably half full so um, the actual capacity is, is somewhat higher and uh, on Titanic's main voyage it was a bit more than half of the uh, of the people uh, on board. Now, um, in terms of um, the uh, the new uh, davits, oh sorry, skip one. Um, uh, we've just got some diagrams here to show um, what they could have done potentially. So, if you can see at the top left, um, this is illustrating what you could potentially have. You've got two lifeboats. Um, and you can see that it's a bit faded out, but that the first one can be lowered overboard. So what's labeled the extreme outward position, you've got the inboard boat and the, the Davit can um, be um, uh, cranked out 
and then back in to take the second lifeboat. And you can see at the bottom, this is a plan of uh, Olympic's uh, boat deck. The white boats were installed and the ones shaded in black were potential second lifeboats that were not included. Now, the benefit of these new uh, davits were that, was that, um, well, primarily, they could fit these new boats if required. The British government was looking at lifeboat regulations and there was some discussion as to increasing them in the future. So Holland and Wolf and White Star, they're being proactive, they're, they're planning ahead. Um, now, what is interesting is that um, the, um, the testimony we have from uh, people at Holland and Wolf is that they never actually recommended that more lifeboats be fitted. They certainly recommended these lifeboat davits. They certainly said that, you know, that we can carry more boats in future if the regulations change, but they never actually said, we recommend you fit 32 boats or 48 or even 64. So a direct quote from Alexander Carlyle, who left Holland and Wolf at the end of June 1910, is that he said, the plan showed how the pair of davits held them but the number of lifeboats was not gone into. The actual number of boats fitted in the ship was settled after I had left the shipyard. So um, that, that wasn't a decision that, um, that had been taken while he was there. And then Edward Wilding, who was um, working for Holland and Wolf closely with, and also with Thomas Andrews, after Andrews um, took on some of Piri's duties, sorry, Carlyle's duties after he left, also said, it's possible to carry um, these additional boats. Whether it's desirable or not is a question we were discussing amongst ourselves at Belfast. And he said the conclusion we arrived at was that it was not one which we cared to recommend to the owners, the, the White Star Line. And uh, Wilding said, in our opinion, the number of boats was sufficient for the purposes for which they were like, most likely to be wanted. And he also said, a great many matters of technical detail are left by the owners, the White Star Line, to us as their experts for decision. So um, the testimony from Holland and Wolf is that they didn't suggest to the White Star Line that more boats were, should be fitted. Um, there are certainly plans of additional lifeboats, but what they testified was that these plans were showing what the Davits could potentially be used for, not a recommendation of, of what um, was going to be fitted. Um, now, one of the one of the ironic things is that because Olympic and Titanic were um, thought to be so safe because they were subdivided by watertight compartments, they could actually have applied to the British government and the Board of Trade for an exemption. So they could have carried fewer lifeboats than were normally required by the regulations. And what you can see here in this chart is the lifeboat capacity in cubic feet. So if they'd applied for an exemption, they only had to carry um, what you see on the far left. Um, the, the ordinary requirements is in the middle, the normal Board of Trade requirements, um, over 9,500 cubic feet. And then what Titanic actually sailed with is on the right. So um, actually, uh, they're about 17, 18% above the ordinary requirements and about 50% over what they could theoretically have, have had as a legal minimum if they'd applied for this exemption. But White Star's policy, and Hound and Wolf really, was essentially to put on what was required by the regulations and uh, with a bit uh, margin of safety on top. So they certainly need to take responsibility, of course. There weren't enough lifeboats for everyone on board. The same was true of so many other ships that were sailing. Um, but I think the context is really that compared to the initial design concept, they actually increased the number of lifeboats somewhat. Didn't, they didn't reduce it. So um, I, I think um, that's, that's more the perspective. It wasn't a conscious decision to decrease. It was more that they decided to increase, but not by, uh, not by the significant amount that uh, um, people have, uh, have said. Of course, uh, early in 1912, Ismay was, uh, was uh, in good spirits. So Olympic had had a main voyage in 1911. It was a great success. Um, and of course, he writes to uh, uh, a fellow uh, uh, shipping, uh, um, uh, well, a, a, a rival 
a director at a, a German shipping company. Um, they're arranging some discussions and he says, well, my daughter's being married on the 21st of March. We'll defer our discussion till sometime in May. And then he explains that his intention, all being well, um, is to make Titanic's first voyage, um, leaving on the 10th of April and being due back on the uh, 27th, which uh, of course, as we know, um, was, uh, was not something that, uh, that happened. Um, now, one of the questions about Ismay on Titanic's main voyage is, was he an ordinary passenger? Um, well, he didn't pay for his ticket. So in that sense, he's not an ordinary passenger and he's the head of the, uh, of the shipping line. Um, but I, I do think a lot of the criticism of him is, um, is way overblown. Um, you, you see in, in, um, in some uh, television adaptions, you know, barking orders to the chief engineer, to the captain. Um, I really don't think that that was the case. Um, we do know a first class passenger who, who overheard um, Bruce Ismay and Captain Smith on the 13th of April, which is the day before the disaster. And um, they were talking in the first class reception room and Ismay was very pleased about how Titanic's main voyage was going. And she testified, she heard him say to the captain, well, we did better today than we did yesterday. We made a better run, uh, sorry, we will make a better run tomorrow. Things are working smoothly. The machinery is bearing the test. The boilers are working well. And then he said to Smith, we will beat the Olympic and get into New York on Tuesday. Um, and she described his attitude as very positive. One might almost say dictatorial. He asked no questions. And it, it, Smith didn't really say much. It was perhaps more of a monologue than a conversation. Um, I don't think that this amounts to is May doing anything more than discussing the ship's performance with the captain. Um, Hand and Wolf had advised Is May that, uh, that Titanic should be slightly faster than her sister Olympic because they'd made some improvements to the propellers. Uh, Titanic was performing well. And they were gradually increasing the speed as they did on Olympic's main voyage. I don't think Smith was ordering Sorry, I don't think Ismay was ordering Smith to, to, to do anything, but he was certainly saying, well, um, we, we, we're doing well um, and uh, we'll get into New York on Tuesday. Um, one of the things that's not widely appreciated, actually, is that Olympic fairly regularly arrived in New York on Tuesday in 1911 and 1912. So from a logistical point of view, that, uh, that wouldn't be uh, an issue. And um, we see Ismay here um, on, the, uh, on the far right. Um, and um, I think he looks, to, to my mind, a bit wary of, uh, of I think it's a, a press photographer that uh, photographs him in New York, um, along with uh, others, including Philip Franklin, who was a vice president of uh, the huge American combine, the International Mercantile Marine. Um, now, uh, well, what we see here is uh, Ismay uh, returning to Liverpool and um, he's um, second man from uh, bottom on the stairs and you can see his bowler hat, he's got uh, his uh, moustache and, uh, and uh, umbrella and um, that's his wife uh, to, the, uh, to the left of him. And you, she almost looks quite um, proud or even beaming, uh, perhaps. Um, he was actually welcomed back to Liverpool um, by, uh, um, by the British. And I think there's quite a contrast between how he was treated in America compared to when he uh, got back to, uh, to Britain. Um, now, one of the uh, first things he did um, when he got back to Liverpool uh, was write to the Right Honourable Earl of Derby, who was the Lord Mayor of Liverpool, and um, what he proposed was a fund for the widows of seafarers who had died at sea. So that was including uh, people who had been uh, widowed um, by uh, Titanic. Now, um, Ismay Senior had established the Liverpool Seamen's Pension Fund um, before that, so it was to provide pensions to British sailors. 
And interestingly enough, in 1912, one of the pensioners was 94. So uh, some people actually got uh, quite a good uh, deal uh, out of it. Um, and then um, after Ismay Senior died, his widow, Margaret Ismay, initiated a fund to um, provide pensions for the widows of pensioners from um, the original fund. Um, so this was um, something that, uh, um, that uh, Ismay was uh, following on from, from what his uh, family had done previously. And um, he wrote a memorandum and his suggestion was um, uh, that um, uh, it would uh, benefit uh, people in this way. Um, there was a total of £11,000. So um, that was uh, donated uh, by 10,000 from his main, as we can see, a, a thousand um, from his uh, from his wife. Now, um, one of the things it, it's not known how, but um, the local press became aware that uh, Ismay had uh, had done this and had written um, to uh, to the mayor of Liverpool. So the mayor of Liverpool got in touch with Ismay. Um, and um, we can see here the, uh, the two uh, telegrams. Um, so he says, well, the courier has apparently heard of your letter. May I publish it with a paragraph saying, I have gratefully accepted your offer. And, um, <coughs> excuse me, Ismay's response, um, uh, well, sent only half an hour later, um, was that please, you should please act in whatever manner you think best. I leave myself entirely in your hands. Um, there are some people who were, I think we should say, cynical about Ismay's motives, um, but he, he certainly didn't say, oh yes, publicise it to the press. Um, he was fairly non-committal. He just says, well, if you think it's best, I leave myself in your hands. Um, and the mayor of Liverpool did actually um, publish, um, publish this. Um, so Ismay retired from the White Star Line and the International Mercantile Marine. Um, contrary to popular belief, this was something that was arranged before the disaster, at least in terms of uh, retiring from the International Mercantile Marine, the big American combine. He had wanted to remain involved with the White Star Line, um, but that was not, that was something that was uh, effectively denied him after the disaster. So um, that was um, something that was unfortunate from his perspective. He didn't have any involvement anymore from uh, his father's firm. Now, uh, Captain Smith, of course, was, um, we well, had several nicknames. One of the nicknames was the Storm King. Um, he was also um, called the Millionaire's Captain by some. And um, here we have a quote from Harold Sanderson, so White Star Line's general manager in 1912. And of course he describes Smith as our senior commander in the service since 1880, been a commander since 1887. He was an extra master. He was, well, retired now, but he'd been a commander in the Royal Naval Reserve and a man in whom we had special confidence. So that's my emphasis. Otherwise he would not have been in that position. Um, so that, that was their view of Smith um, prior to the Titanic disaster. And um, of course, that's why Smith was rewarded with the command of White Star's newest and, uh, and biggest ships. Um, so Baltic, Adriatic, Olympic and uh, Titanic in, uh, in succession. Um, and um, it, it's not the best quality uh, photo, but um, it, it's quite a nice one. This is from a newspaper report, and this is Baltic in um, 19, uh, 1904, when she uh, came into New York. Um, you can see here, of course, the decks lined with, uh, with cheering passengers. Um, and um, I think it should uh, move up shortly, just so we can see um, what might be Captain Smith on the bridge. But, um, oh, that's it. Sorry, I've uh, cut that off. Yeah, so we're just, uh, we're just moving back up. Yeah, so just, just right at the top here, um, you can't see too clearly. I do wonder if that's, uh, if that's Smith that you see 
right at the top of the photo and just a, a bit to the left of the uh, centre, about a third of the way in from the left. You can just see this figure in the, uh, the enclosure of the bridge. Um, so Smith spoke to the press when he uh, got into New York on Baltic. He said, I tried to see how she would work coming round the tail of the Southwest Spit. So this is one of the channels coming into New York. And he said, as the channel was clear, I sent her around at full speed. She behaved admirably. Yeah, we can just see here, um, again, plenty of people on deck as uh, Baltic comes into New York. And uh, of course, in 1907, he'd been promoted to uh, Adriatic. So we see here, and the, these quotes are quite, of course, amazing in hindsight. Um, one of the ship's officers, and I do wonder if it was William Murdoch, um, but it, it is unattributed, so we, we don't know the identity of the officer. But he says, don't, re don't forget when you write of the captain's uneventful life to put in that it is the great captain who does not let things happen. Um, and again, of course, when you look back, um, that's, uh, that's uh, quite remarkable. Um, I mean, I must admit, if you were a, a captain in those days, well, not just those days, but now, you do have to deal with your fair share of problems. And um, for those of you who attended my uh, lecture on the Big Four a couple of years ago, um, one of the incidents that Smith had to deal with was in 1910, when Adriatic was leaving New York, and one of the passengers in the second class shot himself. So um, it was quite a, a remarkable uh, scene and, and this is confirmed by both newspaper reports and the ship's log um, but there's a graphic account of one of the ship's officers with a with a megaphone and they shout they shout out to port authorities that they need a tug because uh, they need to take this uh, deceased uh, passenger's uh, body off um, now, one of the uh, one of the famous quotes of course um, uh, for Captain Smith is uh, where he says, I will say that I cannot imagine any condition which could cause a ship to founder. I cannot conceive of any vital disaster happening to this vessel. Modern shipbuilding has gone beyond that. And this is a quote that was attributed to him when he was in command of Adriatic in 1907. Um, now, a couple of years ago, I, um, I started to get a bit worried or maybe curious we should say because this is a quote that was in the New York Times in April 1912 and it said well Smith said this in 1907 when he brought Adriatic into New York and I looked in the New York Times in 1907 and I couldn't find the quote so I started to think well hang on you know what what's the original source of this because the, the, the worry is you start to think well I really want a pre-disaster source um, and um, there is a um, there is a version of this quote it, it is a, a genuine quote um, but the, the other researchers have been working on this so um, both Captain Smith's biographer Gary Cooper and also a, a, a British researcher Dr Paul Lee who has uncovered some uh, remarkable material um, and um, uh, the quote that Paul Lee uncovered was, was actually quite similar to one Gary Cooper had found um, and this quote was reported in April 1909 so it's before the Titanic disaster but it is after 1907 and it was in a publication called The World's Work and um, this quote is similar, but we, shall we think it's fair to say there's a slightly different emphasis. So the opening of the quote is, I will not assert that she is unsinkable, but I can confidently say that whatever the accident, this vessel, Adriatic, would not go down before time had been given to save the life of every person on board. I will go a bit further. I will say that I cannot imagine any condition that would cause the Adriatic to founder. I cannot conceive of any fatal disaster happening to this ship. Modern shipbuilding has reduced this danger to a minimum. So there are certainly differences there, differences of emphasis, um, and some of the words are slightly different. Um, but another way of looking at it is that you could equally just quote the first bit, and you could have Captain Smith quoting, uh, sorry, saying, I will not assert that she is unsinkable. 
Um, so I, I think it, it is a it is a genuine quote, but I think it's something that um, has been quoted slightly differently in terms of the emphasis just after the Titanic disaster. Um, Right, so uh, here we have uh, Olympic coming into New York on her main voyage. Um, it's a lovely photo. I mean, it's, it's, it's really sharp and it, it, you can actually zoom in. Um, it, it's see people's faces almost, it, it, it's that good. Um, and you can see at the bow, it almost looks like the, the paint has, uh, has come off. Um, you often got this on new ships, so you, Titanic would probably have had the same if she'd come into New York. Cunard's Aquitania had it in 1914 and um, essentially as a new ship the, the, the initial layer of paint has a, a essentially come off um, whereas of course as ships got older they had more than one coat on them so if, if the outer layer sort of came off um, it was less obvious. Um, so I think it's fair to say this was the triumph of Smith's uh, career um, and Olympic certainly had a, a warm welcome to New York. Um, and one of the things that's sometimes said about Captain Smith is that he's particularly accident prone. So, um, you know, in, 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 some, in some tellings, it says that he was in command of the Germanic in uh, 1899 um, when she capsized. Um, in fact, he wasn't the captain. This, this was something that seems to have come from newspaper reports in 1912. But it's, it's clear from Smith's career papers that he wasn't uh, in command. Um, Another incident is when Olympic came into New York on her maiden voyage. A tug was caught in Olympic's starboard propeller. So the starboard propeller was reversed just to aid the tug boats. Um, and um, it actually sliced into the tug and essentially did uh, a lot of damage. Um, now, there's a couple of points here. The um, Olympic was under a, a pilot. Um, and um, the owner of the tug sued the White Star Line for damages. And um, interestingly enough, they sued them just after Titanic had sank. So they didn't sue them immediately in, uh, in 1911. Um, uh, we then have um, the result of that uh, lawsuit and actually the court dismissed it entirely. They ruled that the tug was 100% to blame they didn't attribute any blame to Olympic at all. Um, so it is true that a tug was damaged when Olympic came into New York on her main voyage. Um, but I don't think that that's something that we can attribute to Smith. And I don't think we can say it means he was particularly accident prone. Now, of course, a couple of months after the main voyage, uh, Olympic is leaving Southampton on her fifth westbound crossing. And this is uh, September the 20th, 1911. Now, um, Olympic has left Southampton. She's under, um, she's under the um, navigational command of a pilot um, from Trinity House. And um, what she has to do, um, as we'll see in this chart, is um, execute essentially what, it's almost like a reverse S shaped turn. So if you um, appreciate, there's a lot of detail on, and I hope you can all see it. Um, but if you look right at the top of the chart, um, and I, I miss not having the red pointer, is it, which I would have if it, it was here in person. Um, but you can see right at the top, um, uh, near where it says Calshot Castle and Blackjack Boy, um, we have here the black line which is almost a reverse S shape. So it's Olympic basically heading south and she does what is essentially almost like a reverse S shape. Um, so you can see Olympic here and under the pilot's command, she executes that turn. So um, she's heading um, into the Eastern Channel. Um, so we've got the Isle of Wight at the, uh, at the bottom of the, uh, of the chart here. Um, and you can see here, it says West Cows and uh, East Cows. Um, so uh, Olympic slows down um, somewhat. Um, it was claimed she slowed down to maybe 11 or 12 knots. I don't think she was slowed quite that much, but she did slow significantly. And on completing that turn, um, uh, the order is given full speed ahead. So Olympic starts accelerating to a speed of about 20 knots, um, which is the reduced maximum speed for, for coastal waters. 
um, and her course is south 59 degrees east. Um, now what is also happening as we can see here towards the bottom um, left of the chart um, we can see here it says Hawk. Now Hawk was a rather ancient 7,000 ton Royal Naval cruiser and um, she dated from uh, the start of the 1890s and um, Hawk is also heading into the Eastern Channel and um, Hawk is um, on a course of south 74 degrees east so essentially what is happening is they're converging very gradually but they're converging at an angle of about 15 degrees um, now this is where it starts to get complicated because if um, if these ships are running parallel and one of them is overtaking then the overtaking ship is duty bound to keep out of the way of the other on the other hand if they're crossing so if they're on converging courses then it's olympics duty to keep out of the way of the hawk because hawk is on olympics um, starboard side and um, hawk was maintaining a fairly constant speed of uh, a bit over 15 knots um, whereas olympic of course had slowed down to complete the turn but was then accelerating um, now um, what is quite remarkable is that the two ships they're they're running on what captain smith judged to be virtually a parallel course um, but what happens as olympic is accelerating is that hawk drops back so um, what we have here is captain smith's perception so um, we've got a scale drawing of hawk compared to Olympic and um, how she would have appeared if she was 300, 200 or 100 yards off Olympic starboard side. And um, Smith notices this. She sa he says that Hawk, she seemed to drop astern, or in other words, we gained on her in speed. And immediately after her bow came to port as if she had starboarded, she turned very quickly. Um, and Smith said this it seemed inconceivable a maneuver I could not understand he thought that Hawk had um, uh, had changed helm and had, had turned to port so um, basically putting the helm to starboard means turning to port um, in this context so Hawk is swerving quickly towards Olympic and at this point alarm bells are ringing um, now Smith is on the starboard side of Olympics Bridge looking um, out towards uh, Hawk. Uh, the pilot, uh, George Bowyer, was moving over to the port side of uh, Olympics Bridge and he'd um, got dead amidships um, level with the quartermaster who was steering the ship when Captain Smith called out to him. And um, Captain Smith called out to the pilot, I do not believe he will go under our stern bower. And he thought that Hawk in turning to port was actually going to strike the Olympic and um, Bowyer says if she's going to strike let me know in time to put our helm hard a port there's then a bit of a pause and he says to Captain Smith is she going to strike sir and Smith responds and he says yes Bowyer she is going to strike us in our stern and um, the sad reality is that no evasive action either on behalf of Olympic or Hawk avoided the collision. Um, in the Olympics case they uh, they uh, use the helm, um, Hawk's case um, they uh, reverse the engines as well. Um, it, it was simply simply too late. So Hawk crashes into Olympic and uh, one, um, one witness described it as like a howitzer going off. Um, and uh, there's very serious damage. So we can see here, um, this is something that um, my co-author Sam Halpern, Halpern did um, when we, uh, we published our little book about the collision. Um, but this is Olympic and um, we can see here right at the stern, it's um, one compartment completely flooded, significant amount of water enters a second watertight compartments just 
um, because of the sheer volume of water coming in and um, the watertight doors then close um, which stops any further flooding. Um, so um, Olympic is fine in this sense, she remains afloat, she remains stable, she's in no danger of sinking um, but nonetheless she is, um, she does experience some um, quite severe flooding and um, you can see she, she does settle somewhat at the stern so the portholes um, you can see between watertight bulkheads O and N right towards the stern so under the aft mast you can just see that the portholes on G deck are actually submerged um, and of course Hawk doesn't come away unscathed at all by any means. Hawk um, we can see here is very badly damaged um, and um, essentially her bow is just completely twisted. Um, when Hawk disengaged, she was actually in, in Olympic for a short time, she then disengaged and she was spinning right round. One of her officers described she was spinning like a spinning top. Um, and um, one of the remarkable things is that there was actually an underwater ram. So, um, you know, a rather old fashioned weapon of war, but um, beneath the waterline, Hawk had a ram which was um, designed to puncture enemy warships. And it certainly punctured Olympic and actually the uh, underwater ram fell off. And yeah, we can see here, so right at the top, we've got Olympic and Hawk right after the um, collision. Um, and um, quite a rare photo at the bottom. You, what I like, love about this photo is that they're having to do some temporary um, inspection and repairs at Southampton, but you can actually see that the whole ship's side, there's a, a V-shaped gash or tear, <coughs> excuse me, above the water line. And um, if you look closely, you, you can even see um, one, of the, uh, one of the doors um, inside Olympic, and you can just partly see um, the interior um, panels of, uh, of a corridor. And just seeing the scale of the, uh, the workmen, um, you know, this is very, very severe damage. The, the, the size of the, the men um, shows the, uh, the scale of the, uh, of the damage. Um, now there was a naval inquiry which only had um, Royal Naval personnel from Hawk testifying. So by its very nature, it was one sided and they attributed all the blame to uh, Olympic. Now, White Star Line were understandably unhappy about this and they, um, they sued the government, they sued the Admiralty and um, then um, the, uh, the government, the Admiralty countersued. So they went to court and um, the, uh, the, the lawyers had a field day, really. It was a very contentious case. But essentially the findings were um, Olympic failed to establish that Hawk was overtaking her. Um, so if we remember, Hawk was doing a constant 15 knots, whereas Olympic was accelerating and accelerating up towards 20 knots. Um, and clearly at, at, we have a point where Olympic is accelerating and um, she, um, she surpasses uh, Hawk's speed. Um, it was established that they were crossing vessels because although the ships looked at first glance to be basically parallel, um, we've got their courses on record, so um, they, they weren't, and therefore um, Hawk was on Olympic starboard side, so Olympic should have kept out of the way of Hawk. Um, Hawk was not to blame for what she did, what she admitted to do, um, and it said the course of the collision was the faulty navigation of the Olympic by her pilot in going dangerously near the hawk and the non-observance of the rule which required Olymp her Olympic um, to keep out of the way. Now, um, this was something that was contentious even at the time because in UK law, there was something known as the compulsory pilotage defence. And this defence was essentially that um, Olympic was in compulsory pilotage waters. It was a compulsory pilot who was navigating her, giving all the orders and it, what the court essentially found was well it's olympic that's to blame for the collision however under uk law um, there is the defense of compulsory pilotage um, so um, the, um, the the presiding judge sir samuel evans he said all the orders preceding the, co the collision were given by the pilot 
all his orders were properly obeyed and promptly obeyed. Um, so um, White Star's defence succeeded. Um, even though Olympic was blamed, they, they didn't have anything in terms of damages. Um, White Star did keep appealing. Um, they appealed the verdict. Eventually it was dismissed by the Court of Appeal. They then took it all the way to the House of Lords, which was then the Supreme Court of the United Kingdom until 2009. Um, when the Supreme Court um, was uh, was created and took over. Um, and oddly enough, the judge in the case said, well, it, it might be that we need to repeal the defence of compulsory pilotage. However, that's for Parliament, that's not for me. My role as a judge is essentially to apply the law as it now stands. So that was the law in 1911, and the defence of compulsory pilotage was repealed in the Pilotage Act which was passed by the UK Parliament in uh, 1913. I think it was March um, 1913, it received royal assent. Um, now, um, White Star certainly didn't hold this incident against Captain Smith. Um, so this testimony is from the limitation of liability hearings um, for the um, American government. And um, Ismay testified and he was asked Captain Smith had had a bad accident, had he not, with the Olympic before he took charge of Titanic. And Ismay's um, response is, he was run into by one of His Majesty's ships. The Olympic was in charge of a compulsory pilot at the time. So Ismay and White Star didn't hold this incident against Captain Smith. And um, we can just see here, uh, I mean, apologies, I've had to crop it somewhat to, to get it on the slide. Um, hopefully you can see it. Um, but we have a note under Captain Smith's um, uh, service papers, his service history, and um, there is a note. The 20th of September 1911, the voyage was put back, brackets, damaged by collision with HMS Hawk, and then there's a note, compulsory pilot alone to blame. Um, and then we have the additional voyages on Olympic, and of course his appointment to Titanic on 10th of April 1912. Um, Oddly enough, it says here, she was reported as sinking on the 15th of April and she sank on the 16th of April, which of course is incorrect. She, um, she sank on the 15th of April um, as well. Um, so that's a, a bit of a, a curiosity. Um, so yeah, we have uh, Smith early in 1912 and he's uh, appointed to um, Titanic. Um, and, um, uh, we all we all know. I'm not giving away too many spoilers. We all know uh, what uh, what happened. Um, I include this just for interest. This was something that was published in a, a French journal um, in uh, 1912, and um, it's a, a small hospital ship just compared with an iceberg. So it's that phrase, the tip of the iceberg. You can see how much is below the surface. Um, and of course, the, the top bit is a, a legitimate photo and the bottom has been um, manually drawn um, so that uh, we just gives a sense of perspective. Um, now, um, as a bit of context, um, when Titanic left Southampton on a maiden voyage, um, all the statistics were that this was a safe mode of travel. So um, we've got figures for two decades up to the end of June 1911. Um, and during that time, there were only 13 UK ships that were lost through striking ice whilst on voyages between European ports and the east coasts of both the United States, Canada and Newfoundland. Um, none of those 13 ships that had been lost had um, experienced any loss of life. The passengers and crew um, were all uh, able to, uh, to, to be rescued. And of them, only one of those ships had been lost south of latitude 45 degrees. Um, so the ice tended to be further, further north. And for reference, um, Titanic was, um, was uh, south of um, this when, uh, when she was lost. Um, so um, statistically speaking, um, the odds were in favour of Titanic having a safe voyage. Um, I mean, there, there is one warning, and that is that, that is that there are some ships that were lost and they were never heard from again. 
So it's possible that some of them struck icebergs um, and, and, and were lost. But equally, we, we don't know what their fates were, so we, we, can't, we can't say uh, either way. Now, um, Titanic, um, when she sailed, was on what was known as the, uh, the Southern Route. Um, and um, according to um, re reports of ICE, th this, this route, which was essentially agreed from the late 1890s by the, the major shipping lines, it could be varied um, depending on uh, ICE reports. So, for example, in 1903, 1904, 1905 and 1906, um, the route was um, shifted south um, because of reports of ice. And um, in 1905, for example, it was shifted south with effect from the 14th of April, um, which, of course, is quite a coincidental, de coincidental date because um, that is the date that uh, Titanic um, uh, struck the iceberg in uh, in 1912. It was uh, the evening of Sunday, April 14th. Um, and uh, ironically, it was on the 11th of April 1912 when Titanic left Ireland um, that the first serious reports of ice started to come in. Um, so my opinion is it's a fairly safe bet that um, had Titanic sailed um, slightly later, um, we'd probably have been in a situation where the, uh, the route would have been moved um, further south. Um, I mean, now, of course, um, captains were able to use their discretion. You know, the, it's, it's simply a, a, a standard that, um, you know, the, the typically agreed route was moved south. Um, if uh, commanders needed to, to divert, to change course, they were perfectly able to, they weren't limited by any means. But if it had been moved south, then that would have been the, uh, the default um, position. Um, so um, Titanic, as we know, um, struck the iceberg on the night of Sunday 14th of April. Um, Captain Smith, um, I, I don't think had been acting any differently to, to, to normal. Um, I, I, as we, we saw earlier, I, I, I don't think he was under particular pressure from, from Ismay. Um, I, I think Captain Smith was navigating the ship as he would have done regardless of whether um, the White Star Chairman was on board. Um, it's, it's popularly said that Smith did alter course slightly south. So um, uh, the, uh, on the afternoon of the 14th of April, Titanic reached a location called the Corner. And it's when she was at that position that um, she altered course slightly, a, a more direct um, route heading to New York. Um, and it, it, it's typically said that um, actually the, the turn was delayed so that uh, Titanic went a bit further south. And perhaps this was because of ice reports. Um, in my opinion, that's not the case. I think it comes from a misunderstanding that Titanic should have been at the corner at 5 p.m. on the afternoon of Sunday, 14th of April. Um, in fact, it, she would have had to go much faster than she was capable of to have got there for 5 p.m. So I think that's just a, a, an error there in, in terms of timing. Um, so Smith could have changed course, but he didn't. Um, he didn't put the engine room on standby. Um, so, he, you know, he could have ordered that the engineers be at their stations ready to respond to any sudden um, engine order command, which, of course, had to be telegraphed from the bridge. Um, he didn't post additional lookouts. Um, I mean, there is there is some debate as to whether that would have been effective and, you know, additional uh, for additional context. There, there were other commanders at the time that said they might have done or, or, or would not have done. Um, but I think what you can say is that posting additional lookouts who wouldn't have hurt. Um, although they, they might not have um, necessarily spotted the iceberg any quicker. Um, so um, in that sense, I, I think it's, it's, it's really a matter of complacency, I, I suppose. And, and of course, the official verdict in, uh, in Britain was that 
um, Smith was following normal practice and it wasn't negligence in the case of Titanic but it would be negligence in the future which is a bit of a way of splitting it and saying well actually he was following a practice that was flawed so it's judging it that way rather than um, rather than attributing the, the blame to Smith um, in that sense but of course if you might be following usual practice but still you're ultimately responsible for the um, for the passengers and crew um, as the uh, as the ship's captain um, so the night of 14th, the Sunday 14th of April, um, uh, Smith had told um, Lytoller, the officer of the watch, um, if anything um, happens, if conditions become at all doubtful, let me know, I will be just inside. Um, and um, Lytoller then uh, passed that on to Murdoch, at, Officer Murdoch, at uh, 10 o'clock that evening. And at 11.40, um, there is a, a rather unfortunate tremor and Smith comes out onto the bridge and he says, what was that, Mr. Murdoch? Um, now, the officers were expecting ice. Um, so it, it's interesting that Smith's first thought doesn't seem to have been, well, actually, we struck an iceberg. Um, but we got two witnesses and they, they basically agreed that was the wording. What was that, Mr. Murdoch? Not have we struck an iceberg? Um, and... Um, we have quite a, a graphic um, a, a account um, of, of, uh, of what followed. Um, so uh, an American researcher, um, George uh, Behe, um, did a detailed analysis um, quite a few years ago of all the various um, eyewitness testimony. And of course we see Smith ultimately going uh, below decks to, uh, to inspect the damage. Um, and Thomas Andrews was on board, who um, was of course part of the guarantee group at Harland and Wolf. And um, him and Smith uh, apparently meet below decks. Um, and um, Andrews is overheard saying, three have gone already, Captain, which seems to be a reference to the fact that he'd found out at that point that three watertight compartments were flooding. Um, now, an interesting point is that Titanic could have remained afloat with the first four watertight compartments flooded. However, that was not explicitly in the design criteria. That was just a happy side effect, if you will, of the design. And it was only after the disaster, when Edward Wilding um, uh, did all his calculations, that he realised Titanic would have survived with four compartments flooded. So. Uh, at that point, potentially, um, Andrews is saying, well, three have gone already. And, you know, potentially they're, they're, they're already at, uh, at the limit. Um, so Smith uh, returns to the bridge and he knows the ship is seriously damage, damaged. Uh, Andrews remains below decks. Uh, of course, there's no doubt the ship's taking on water. The mail room is flooding. Um, there is some um, flooding reported in the various holds, uh, the four peak, the four peak tank, um, that is, and uh, of course, boiler room six. And boiler room six is really the, the fatal one because that is the compartment that is the fifth one and essentially seals the, uh, the ship's uh, fate. And um, there's a first class passenger, Mrs. Warren. Um, she encountered Thomas Andrews on the grand staircase on uh, D deck. So he's coming up from below decks through the first class reception room and is rushing up the staircase. And um, she described that Andrews had a look of terror on his face because he's realised the extent of the damage to the ship and that the ship is going to sink and is actually going to sink relatively um, quickly. Um, so um, we then have, uh, I mean, it, it is a, a second-hand account, of course, but we have an account from uh, Fourth Officer Boxall, who, uh, of course, survived and testified. And... Um, this is after the collision. Captain Smith is inquiring, well, you know, how are, the, how are the crew getting on in terms of preparing the lifeboats and everything? And Boxall says, yes, they're carrying on all right. And he, he just asks the captain, is it really serious? And Smith responds, Mr. Andrews tells me he gives her from an hour to an hour and a half. So th there's that remarkable piece of news on what was a successful, apparently uneventful maiden voyage they hit an iceberg. Smith then knows the ship's been seriously damaged, which is bad enough, but he then becomes aware that the ship is sinking. And then to make matters even worse, he soon becomes aware that 
the ship is going to sink relatively quickly and help is too far away. So they're not going to be able to ferry passengers and crew to rescue ships in time um, before the ship um, sinks. Um, I, I think really that the criticism of, of Smith is actually that the ship hit the iceberg in the first place. Um, I, I'm less critical of him for what happened after the collision. Um, I mean, it, it sounds like an obvious point, but we have the benefit of knowing what happened. Um, for all Smith knew, Andrews' estimate could have been off. The ship could have sunk even, could have foundered even quicker. Um, you know, we, we know that they were able to get the majority of the boats away and that there wasn't a panic. However, at the time when Smith is ordering this evacuation in the middle of the night, that's not something he knows yet and that's not something that's guaranteed. Um, I, I mean, the, there is some criticism, for example, of uh, early light, the early lifeboats, the first to be lowered, being lowered relatively empty. Um, I, I think that there's a number of points here. I mean, the, the officers know that the ship is sinking. Um, uh, at least it, it certainly appears Murdoch did. That's the impression that third officer Pittman had when he spoke to Murdoch before Pittman got one on one of the earlier lifeboats. Um, so I think to an extent, actually, there is a reassuring effect if passengers and crew see a lifeboat being lowered successfully. Um, another point to bear in mind is that these lifeboats, uh, I mean, the, the standard one had a capacity of 65 people. Now, all that is based on is a formula for how, ma how many cubic feet the average person takes up. So it's got the cubic, the capacity of the lifeboat in cubic feet, and it's the assumption that each person takes up 10 cubic feet. Well, that, that, that's of course an average. And actually, um, just to put it in a bit of context, and, and this is some research um, from an Australian researcher, Dave Giddens, Gittins, um, he said that actually by modern standards, the capacity of these lifeboats would be more like, I think it was 24 or 28 people, not 65. So you, you hear of a lifeboat being lowered with 28 people when its capacity is 65, or even with 40 people or 45, 50 people. Actually, a, a lifeboat with that many people will, will still look relatively full. Um, and I do think there's a natural inclination. As time went on, they had, um, shall we say there was less reticence from people to, to enter the lifeboats. Um, and I think the ship's crew grew in confidence because they'd seen lifeboats lowered and they'd been lowered successfully. So they gradually um, managed to increase the, uh, the, the number of people um, that were in a lifeboat and, and therefore that, that were saved. Um, so, you know, that's not to excuse mistakes that Smith made or the ship's crew. I mean, I think there certainly were mistakes, um, but I, I just mentioned those as points of context, really. And I mean, it's, it's quite a, a fascinating subject. You could go into detail on all sorts of aspects of the evacuation. Um, but, um, but yeah, so for Captain Smith, uh, the sad reality, he had a long, illustrious career. And of course, the last entry on his CV is as uh, captain of the Titanic. So um, I think it is a bit unfair that the reputation he has in hindsight for, um, you know, for being described as particularly incident prone, um, but certainly as the captain of the Titanic, um, that, that is something that um, is uh, associated with him forever. And um, whether he's following the procedure for the time or not, he's the, uh, he's the captain and, um, he bears the responsibility and um, I think no one, um, no one probably uh, blames him more than, uh, than I suspect he uh, probably blamed himself um, because he had a period of two hours or so knowing what was going to happen and knowing uh, what uh, um, he was uh, responsible for. Okay, so uh, thanks, uh, thanks very much for listening.